my name is, for those of you who uh, haven't been here before to these events, uh, my name is Dick Pullman. Um, I teach journalistic writing in uh, the creative writing program uh, based here and the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing. And thank you uh, to uh, the Kelly Writers House for co-hosting, I guess we can say, because our guest today is, uh, is here through the auspices of the um, Perry World House right next door as their writer at risk. And uh, we'll be talking about risk today uh, in just a moment. Um, I've got a couple events coming up in November. I'm not going to list them now. You can stay tuned for them. I don't want to detract from uh, our topic and our guest today. Uh, this is uh, Zeta Erhaim, right here. Uh, I'm just reading from uh, the list that I have here. Uh, is an award-winning uh, Syrian journalist uh, working as a communications manager with the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. Uh, in, and uh, she lives in London. She's here for the week. Uh, she's trained over 100, well over, I believe, 100 media activists on journalism basics in Syria, uh, her native country. Uh, and made a series of short films uh, entitled Syria's Rebellious Women and Syria Diaries, narrated by Syrian women. Uh, she's contributed to three different books. Some you can see the, uh, the list online. Uh, and I think this was interesting. She taught a course called Conflict Sensitive Mobile Journalism uh, at Bremen Art University in Germany. You have an MA in, the international, in international journalism uh, from City University of London. Uh, and written for The Economist and The Guardian and worked for the BBC and other local media outlets. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk some about what's going on, needless to say, in Syria, but also just about, uh, since we are here at the Writer's House, uh, how a journalist works in such an environment. And uh, she has many experiences to share, and we'll have room for questions. Uh, so please welcome Zaina Erhem. Uh, I wanted to read something just by way of introduction, uh, and then you can elaborate on this for us uh, by way of introduction. This is something I, I found that you wrote in August, uh, where you were describing yourself. Um, you said, I have, I'm quoting here, I have committed all the sins that would potentially be committed in such an awful war zone. I am a Syrian, a woman who lived in the most masculine of spaces a journalist in a land of warlords, a secularist living among different kinds of extremists and foreign jihadists, and a human rights defender among war criminals. Uh, and I thought by that by way of introduction, if you could perhaps elaborate on that uh, for the audience. Yeah, well, let me start by the kind of bullying that I got for publishing. This is an abstract from one of the chapters I wrote for um, a book called Our Women on the Ground, which is for Middle Eastern local women journalists who reported on their home wars. And an abstract was published in this magazine about my chapter and the amount of bullying and attacks that I got from secular Syrian activists who accused me of using my journalism position uh, for exposing and criticizing our communities instead of defending them against what is happening to them and accusing me of even, although it's, it's personal testimony, I was even accused of faking things that our societies wouldn't do, like being patriarchal or suppressing women. So uh, especially that sentence, um, because sadly, even those secular activists who are supposed to be human rights defenders, when it comes to women, they turn into very much misogynist. So they're defending human rights on one level, they're defending uh, freedom of expression as long as it wouldn't include accusing our communities or our societies of being suppressive for, for their women. So this is the first thought uh, that came to my mind when publishing it. So after passing all of that, even putting a context or describing what you've been through is something that you are being bullied about. So it's not just the physical thing, it's the mental thing that, that would follow. Is it possible at this point to, um, is it possible how, all right, is it possible this, at this point to report honestly and objectively in the journalistic sense that we all, at least in the West, understand journalism in such a polarized war zone? I mean, are people doing the kind of work that, uh, 
that we would recognize as journalism at this point, or is it so difficult, is the physical danger, among other things, so difficult uh, that it cannot be done? To be frank, I wouldn't tell them to report independently and objectively because that means I am encouraging them to kill themselves. If I told those people who are reporting, whether from regime-held areas, whether from the Kurdish-controlled areas, whether from the rebel-held areas or all the different occupations areas in Syria, if I told them report the story as it is supposed to be reported, uh, being objective, um, tell all the things or violations that are being committed by the people who are controlling your area, that is a death penalty. <coughs> I can't really ask the local journalist to be that much professional if I'm not helping them out when they're committing the story, when they're doing it. If I can't relocate them, if I can't uh, pay money for their kidnappers to get them out, if I can't give them insurance when they lose a limb, if I can't get them into a refugee when they are hit, if I can't help their families if they're killed. So I think this pressure is applied on local journalists, like do the perfect work that we're doing in the Western countries, but when you're in trouble, sorry, we can't do anything for you. So this is for me is, is really something that I struggle with. When I was giving a training um, for local women in Idlib, that was 2016, I remember, or maybe 15. And I was telling them that no story worth your life they were laughing because like, we were living in a rebel-held areas and like, they were bumming all around us. So like, protecting themselves from being randomly killed is something impossible. And then I told them, like, none of us can really guarantee that we're going to be living for the next hour. But random killing is far more easier than the targeted killing. So you can protect yourself from being assassinated. And this is why you need to choose your story. But being randomly killed is something like no one can guarantee. So for me, for all of those stories that are being written, I think the best thing that can the, the journalist in those areas can do is to avoid the things and avoid being propagandalist, and this is being heroes. But for them to report objectively and professionally, this is really very dangerous. Um, I want to ask about some of your your own experiences um, about that very, on those very issues. But I want to just bring in first something from the news. Um, there's uh, reports this morning and last night in the Times and the Post, I think, about uh, with the, the U.S. troops being pulled back, Trump pulling the troops out. Uh, people were throwing um, potatoes, ripe fruit, stones at the uh, retreating. U.S. forces as they were leaving, saying thank you for betraying us and uh, hurling obscenities, etc. cetera. Um, taking that one incident in the last few, in the last day, could you put that into a bigger picture context for us? And what does that mean for you when I'm sure you heard about these reports? What does that mean to you? I guess that's two overlapping questions. You can take it either way you want. Um, my last visit to the U.S. Um, two years ago, um, there were some talks, and I did some official meetings and media meetings. There were some talks about the U.S. coalition on interfering in Syria. And my position in that year, which is uh, still valid until now, is that you can't really in just interfere against one terrorist group, leaving all the other terrorist groups there. You either interfere to eliminate the terrorism and then lead the, which would help the country into going into peace, or you don't interfere at all. So at that point, my point of view, and I think many who were on the ground and who are like moderate trying to make the change, thought that the US intervention against the Sunni extremist jihadists, foreign jihadists, which is ISIS, and leaving all the other Shia militias, jihadists who are also foreigners and who are fighting on the regime side, coming from Iran, from the Hazars, from Pakistan, is a clear indication for many moderate Muslims is that we're actually siding with the Shiites against the Sunni because we're interfering only about one part of the terrorism and we're leaving the others. That gave many that impression that the whole West is siding against Sunnis and this is a war against Sunnis and we're supposed to be good jihadi Sunni to protect 
um, ourselves and our community from that attack. So at that point, I was against the invasion, and I was still living inside Syria then. And although I know those fight jets wouldn't come and bomb me because I was in Aleppo, but it was just a scary thing to have three different fight jets above your head. I was able to recognize the Russian one because they're pretty loud and evil, but I wasn't able to recognize the US ones. For the civilians, it's just yet another fight jets fighting on their head. And I know many families in, Ira in Raqqa who lost uh, family members because of the crimes committed um, by the coalition. And I haven't really seen a proper Maybe um, I don't read American media a lot, but I haven't seen like a proper <coughs> um, attribute to those crimes committed or to those civilians killed on the side while you're fighting ISIS. There are many families who lost their homes, who lost their kids. Two of my friends were kidnapped by ISIS and no one knows what happened to them after Raqqa was liberated. And there were many pressure from the families of those kidnappees on the US and on SDL, the Kurdish forces, you know, we just want to know whether our kidnapped beloved family members are alive, killed, we want to know where they're buried. And I haven't seen like a proper movement from the coalition, which is based there, to find the grave, the mass graves, or to identify those who were persecuted or killed uh, by ISIS. So for me, the general idea of the US interfering in Syria was, was very, heavy and I, and I couldn't really understand or see the end of it. And now um, I think the unplanned, unpredicted withdrawal, which led into yet another war uh, being committed there. Uh, for many locals in Raqqa and their resort mainly, um, it's, you know, they think they were occupied <coughs> by a force, which is US and Kurdish. And now there is another force coming, which is the Turkish. So for them, it's just like people taking turns into controlling their lands, mainly forces that don't even bother to ask the locals what they want, um, how they want their schools, their houses to be rebuilt, um, what kind of media they aim for. Everything is being enforced on them, and they feel that they don't have a voice. And um, I'm not surprised. I think. The Kurdish, <coughs> the Kurdish community mainly are the ones who felt betrayal right. by, by the U.S. forces. Um, for the local Arabs in, in Raqqa and their Zor, they feel like the whole world is against them and no one really care or ask about the civilians in those areas. They're very much neglected. And they paid the price of ISIS occupation the most. Most of those who were killed, those, most of those who were slaughtered and kidnapped, they were from those two communities. And despite that, until now, <coughs> they're really being perceived as the hosting communities of ISIS, as if they're. And actually, we all are. All of us who lived in northern Syria, well, one of the sins that I committed, why I said I, I, the, mm. the sin of being Syrian, two years ago, I was traveling to the UK before applying for asylum there. I was traveling to the UK uh, to receive an award, and I was stopped by the UK border agency, and I was told that my government reported my passport as a stolen. And I was like, but you have my picture, my date of birth, and my fingerprint. And they said, yeah, but the Interpol system says your passport is stolen. And I, I studied on Achieving Scholarship, which is funded by the FCO, and I work with BBC, so they do have all my records. And eventually that led for them seizing my passport and forcing me into applying for asylum eventually, because the regime could easily manipulate the system and put my name as I stole my own passport. And he, I told him, like, you know, this is not a, this is not a government against a citizen. This is a regime against a journalist, and you're taking his side. And he said, like, this is the system. So this is a regime. And then, as you can expect, whenever I travel, like my US visa, although I have two invitations from this, and I have an invitation from the State Department, took six months, and I missed coming last year right. because of that. And I was interrogated, luckily, for one hour only this time, but the last time I was interrogated for three hours. And many of the questions I was asking, they were only based on me being Syrian. And most of them were like, do I have any relation? Do I know any jihadis? Have I have been with jihadis? Yes, I was living in an area controlled by them. I know many, but that doesn't mean I agree on what they're doing. I was. I was documenting their violations. I was doing far more than what you're doing in fighting the extremism mentalities. Like killing a jihadi is 
a good thing, you will eliminate one person. But to fight the ideology, you need to do more on the ground. Me and all of the Syrians who are inside Syria, mainly the Syrian uh, civil society organizations, are doing that on the ideological level. And although, despite that, they are being accused of being pro-jihadis when they're abroad in neighboring countries or where they're traveling. So this is very complicated. But for me, as I see it, it's just yet another war. Well, it's just you said the word complicated because uh, the former CIA director, John Brennan, uh, said not long ago that uh, uh, that uh, Syria and what was happening there was the most comp he, he used the word the most complicated thing that he had to deal with uh, during his tenure, uh, and I think and Obama said something similar to that. Uh, so I take it by that if we're looking here at the big picture, that that overall I disagree if this if, if this be the case that that o neither Obama and certainly not Trump has quite figured out exactly what America's posture should be. I mean, they want to, you know, they want to, well, particularly Obama, wanted to intervene for humanitarian reasons, but didn't want to get drawn in to uh, another war a la what happened with uh, Bush in Iraq. Uh, so there were, it's one of these situations in foreign policy where there's no, they're all very imperfect answers. There's uh, no magic solution. Uh, or am I being too, uh, am I being too um, easy? on uh, American decision makers? Well, the Syrian perspective is that really Obama has has hurt the Syrian uh, potential peacemaking far more than Trump. Uh, when he set that red line for Assad regime about using the chemical weapon, and then when the chemical weapon was used and 1,500 people were killed in one small tiny area, he then changed his mind that was a green line for all the regimes in all the areas, for all the neighboring countries to keep using whatever they want to use because we set red lines and we don't commit to them. And Syria before the chemical uh, massacre is different from Syria after the chemical <coughs> massacre. Um, even in terms of journalism, many of the citizen journalists who start to do documenting what is happening started hoping that if we capture, if we document the pictures, the videos of what's happening, the international community, God, whoever is going to be seeing those, can do something <laughs> to stop it. After the chemical massacre, many of those who I know, and I trained, and I was working with, they just stopped. Why am I filming this? I am risking my life to take that shot, thinking that it might be lead to some justice, or at least to stop those events from happening. So in our perspective, setting that red line, and then dropping it, and letting Assad go with what happened, is what really led us to here. If something has happened then, and things were not as bad, and we were not having those extremists, those foreign jihadists, uh, like even the, ref the refugee and immigrants um, waves were not starting then yet, because people were hopeful that things would stop and we can still live in our country. But after that, everything has changed. And what year was the chemical warfare? What, what year was this chemical attack, the red line? I'm asking for to look at a piece of chronology here. Remember what year that was? Um, that was 2015 or 13. Yeah, we, we have plenty of massacres. It's pretty yeah. difficult to keep all the dates. I think it was uh, 15, 15, maybe 14 or 15. Okay, and that was when you left Syria. Am I correct? I, I left it. I left it after. After that. Okay, so yeah. you lived check. in you lived in Aleppo for uh, from between 2012 and 2015. Yeah. Those three years. I was roaming around, but eventually I stayed in Aleppo. Okay. Um, and I read somewhere else, some other piece, I think you did uh, an interview with somebody from the Times in London, where you were saying that for much of that time, when you were living in Aleppo, you would hear these um, planes come over, and uh, they'd be dropping, I guess this is Assad's planes, dropping um, barrel bombs, I believe they were called, and uh, you'd be, right, this would be in the middle of the night, and you were trying to sleep through it and, uh, and I guess uh, I mean, we're all glad that you're here and unharmed. Uh, In a way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> physically I, I yeah. guess. Um, but uh, you know, what kind of everyday precautions did you, I mean, right, if you cover your head you don't know where those bombs are going to be landing. So yeah, they landed very close by you according to one of the pieces that you were interviewed in. Uh, what kind of day-to-day -day precautions did you take to at least successfully, physically, uh, 
escape the worst that could have happened to you. Okay, to put things into constant to context, um, this happened with me two years ago, but it is still happening with many of my friends and family members who are still living in Idlib. Idlib is a small province in north uh, west Syria. Where you were born. Right? This is my home. Yeah, this is my home uh, province. I was born and, and lived in Idlib. So this is happening now while we're speaking, um, mainly by Russian, uh, Russian force. And there are no there are really nothing that you can do to to avoid a barrel bomb. A barrel bomb is an actual barrel filled with not only explosive materials, but sometimes with junk. Um, sometimes we found um, old coins, um, lethal, not lethal, um, what is this called? Iron, iron balls, like really just nails, really just junk. <laughs> like materials that would make the massive maximum uh, damage. So when a barrel bomb hits a building, you're dead. There's nothing that you can do. But if it hits a nearby place, then there is something that you can avoid those like lethal shrapnels, um, which is going to the corridor. And I lived most of my time <laughs> when I was in Elipo in the corridor because I was uh, too scared of them. Um, if you're in the basement, then the civil defense, which didn't have that much of advanced equipment, they might not reach you. So the, the decision that you need to take at those moments is whether you would rather be killed directly if you're in the first, second floor, or you, whether you would give it the chance and die of suff suffocating in the basement. There is no way out. We, I think we were all, and now all the people, all the civilians who are living in Idlib are just living by coincidence. If the barrel bomb, if the missile hit an area, and especially now Idlib is pretty crowded because all the people who were deported, forcibly deported from southern Syria, uh, from uh, central Syria, were deported to the province. So my province used to be like <laughs> maximum seven, uh, 700,000, and now around 4 million people are living in it. All of them are forcibly displaced. So now even like a mortar would kill three people. So any missile that would hit the area, it would kill the people. There is no way out. There is nothing that you can do. My area is well known for being uh, one of the, old, it has uh, those oldest cities. So some people went back to live in caves. They just really put some lights and lights in the caves and they went back living in it because it will minimize the amount of shrapnels that you take. But if a barrel bomb or a missile hit the cave, you're dead anyway. So this is a kind of general situation. So, all right, so when you were there and you were trying to minimize the risk, whatever you could do, I saw in this also piece that, this piece that you also said that I guess this is a, a cultural necessity there, that when you were going around trying to uh, report uh, that you needed to be accompanied by a man. Uh, you explain what, uh, why that was necessary and and um, how you dealt with that? Yeah, one of the hardest thing as an independent and very powerful and outgoing uh, woman, I, I, I claim I am, um, in, even in my province and the northern areas, they're very much conservative, so women wouldn't move on their own. And at some point, I had to put headscarf to look more like the local woman, and I'm, I'm local, but I don't dress like the typical local women. Um, Especially when traveling, all the women must have uh, a male garden. And on the checkpoints, the male garden is the person who speaks on behalf of the woman. So even <coughs> if, if the checkpoints uh, armed man asked me, asked a question to the, my male garden, he wants to ask me something, he would ask my male, who, what's her name? Why is she coming? What is she doing? So it will like, go from him to me. Um, so this was one of the most difficult things. And I don't have any, the male garden is supposed to be a, like a first relative who you're not allowed to be married. So it must be like really close member of your family. And I don't have any inside. All my family members are women. So I had to create ones. Um, so I faked, I think, three uncles, two cousins, and four husbands to be able to pass the checkpoints. And the hardest was when I was passing, I spent most of my time there in Raqqa. And it was one of the most uh, like lovely experiences and the maximum freedom I lived during the uprising. 
Raqqa, unlike what everyone knows, the capital of the caliphate, was very much um, open, and the people were very much open-minded. It, it is the place where I wasn't forced to put a headscarf. I was wearing a T-shirt and jeans, like most of the women in the city itself. And I remember I even had like a short, very blonde hair. So I, I, was, I was looking awkward, and I was walking in the streets with armed forces without even uh, being harassed or being talked to. Most of the NGOs that were active in Raqqa, and I'm speaking about 2013 and 14, before ISIS completely took over. Most of the NGOs that were active there, half of them were women. Most of them like, were very modern women, uh, well-educated, uh, headscarf, not headscarf, wearing makeup. They were like really the kind of women that you would see uh, in any street here. So for me, Raqqa was like the brightest example. And the last time I was there, it was December 2013. ISIS took over in, this, in January 2014. Um, I remember at that point, I was passing by with a friend and I was claiming I'm his sister. So he gave me his sister uh, ID. And the funny thing is that all the IDs I had were for tall and dark eyes women. And no one even noticed or asked. <laughs> Um, because most of, especially the jihadis, they would put their thumb on the picture when looking at the name, so they wouldn't be tempted by my beauty, which is not my beauty, it's <laughs> the other girl's beauty. Um, so that was the hardest thing, because ISIS jihadis were very much advanced in the security, so they would separate me and my garden, and would ask us the same question to see whether we have identical answers. So I was pretty scary, and I was like memorizing, what's your father's name? What's your mother's name? When they were married? What's your cousin? Uh, where were you living before? Because they might be asking those questions. It, it, passed, it passed well. We, we wouldn't stop, uh, thankfully. I was then Sarah. I think I was uh, one meter and 70, uh, I wish, one meter and 70 tall, uh, centimeters tall. Uh, but I remember at that last visit in Raqqa, I was, after passing that checkpoint, I think it was a Yemeni jihadis who stopped us at the checkpoint. But after we passed it and we entered the city of Raqqa, at the main street where ISIS had a base there, and there were different jihadist groups, I saw women who had their <coughs> hair done very beautifully, and they were wearing like long skirts and walking in the streets laughing and speaking, and I was like, oh my god, this is inside that checkpoint. This is after that checkpoint I passed. Even the headscarf women, they were putting very bright uh, lipsticks. For me, that was the resilience of those local women to the jihadis. Like, to see an, um, a jihadi wearing all black, mainly Afghani uh, dress code, Passing by a woman who is making curly hair and putting a full makeup, and she's smiling in the street, like I wouldn't have believed that if I if, if I told if I was told. Uh, sadly, the the month after, ISIS took over and everything um, was finished by then. When you passed checkpoints in terms in as you were trying to go about your work, did you use um, were you using notebooks, cameras? digital recorders, I mean, or were you just trying to walk around as uh, uh, and commit everything to memory, in other words, moving as, as uh, low pro as possible? It depends on the area and the time. At the beginning of the uprising 2012 and 13, uh, the movement for media, even international media, was pretty easy. I met most of the international journalists that I know in northern Syria at that point. Then when jihadists started to took over and those uh, kidnapping groups started to flourish in the north, things became uh, much more difficult. At some point, I wasn't able to move with a camera and I had to have uh, one of my friends to take a, like a gun or an arm with, with us in the car so if we got robbed or someone attacked us, he would be able to show that he has some power but I wouldn't allow him to use it because I was too scared uh, to get killed in the crossfire. Um, so thanks escalated. It, it didn't just start by forbidding anyone from having cameras. Um, some checkpoints would really care more about how related I am to the man next to me than uh, if I am filming their violations. <laughs> some others wouldn't care at all. 
So it depends. If there is um, like a security situation, a battle between two fractions or something like that, then the security alert is at its maximum. I went back um, to Idlib and Aleppo directly after the rebels defeated ISIS. Um, that was the end of 2014. There were very big battles against ISIS, and they kicked them out from Udleb, from firstly Aleppo and then Idlib, and that's why they all went into a Raqqan station there. At that period of time, everyone was so scared of the car bombs because ISIS was were spreading them all over the area. So at that point, really, I felt like the checkpoints is for the security of the people because what they care about is the bombs and the explosive. And they stopped asking me about the garden. They were mainly checking the trunk, they were checking the car, and I was pretty happy at the checkpoints. I, I didn't care because it is for the security. But in general, it's just yeah, having fun, asking about how you're related, where you're coming from. Um, in many cases, funny enough, they wouldn't believe that I am a local journalist because they don't believe that there are women local journalists. So you're either foreigner or you're not a journalist. So there is nothing in the middle. And at some point I was, I gave them my Syrian ID and I still have it. And like, I am very local, I'm from the same area that I was at. And I was like, I am a journalist, I am coming here to report the stories. And I was like, you speak very well Syrian. I was like, you have my ID and I'm speaking very local dialect. But that wasn't easy to believe as if a woman and a journalist and a local combination together. Sorry. Uh, did you, um, uh, well, let me, let me jump ahead and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Okay, so um, just give me like uh, two more minutes here. Um, one of the other, uh, this is just sort of uh, going forward here for um, uh, four or five years uh, from this other, from this piece that you, uh, that you wrote. Again, uh, you mentioned here that over the past four years, uh, you've barely had uh, 10 articles published, uh, even though you have uh, written 80 pages of outlines and notes saved in a file that you've entitled Can't Be Published. Um, I'm curious as to, uh, well, two questions then. Is there anything that you feel you can say now that you couldn't say then? Uh, and were you not publishing a lot of this uh, material because you were afraid maybe that you would endanger somebody who was back on the ground there? One of the difficulties about having a mill garden is not just passing the checkpoints, is that whatever you do, you're not going to be held accountable for it, but someone else will. And that's why I eventually decided to put a headscarf up, because the checkpoints are not bothering me. They're bothering my male friends. Why you're not asking her to put a headscarf, ask her. And then sometimes they took them aside and they beat them. So this is how they forced me into following their dress code. So I am a daring person, and I am known to burn, we, we say that term in Arabic, burn my boats when I travel to other place. However, especially in the rebel health areas, so in 2012, I started reporting <coughs> about the uprising. So I was put on different wanting list for the regime. So I wasn't allowed to go to any regime held areas which is where I lived most of my life, in Damascus and even Idlib at that time. And then in the rebel hood areas, I decided I want to stay longer. I don't want to burn my boats. And then be it became even more dangerous because I'm endangering the lives of the people, mainly the men who are helping me out to stay there and my family members, it's not just me. So I decided to try to stay as long as I can, which is the thing that we started with if you want to be independent and report the violations, this is a death penalty. Mm -hmm. If you're an international journalist going into Syria and you have a home that you can go back to, you can do that scoop. Gain plenty of publicity, become famous, name a war reporter, get some awards, and go to your secure home. If you're local, you can't do that. If it's not about you, it's your family. Even in southern Turkey, some journalists were assassinated by ISIS. And many journalists were deported by Turkey because um, they did something that which, was, which they shouldn't be doing. So I mean, there is no security as long as you want to be connected with that region. And the precaution, the precaution or like, the risks that you need to put in mind when you're reporting the story is far more than the international journalists do. But I couldn't keep silent because I'm a very vocal person. So what I did is just writing down 
very simple things like today is the 25th October someone has killed <laughs> that person in front of me because he's gay reported and then hide it in my drive and I was hoping that someday I'm going to be writing this into a book which is I'm trying now and there are plenty of things that I couldn't do or say like the things about the headscarf like that paragraph which is still causing many cyber bullying for me because writing it so even after being safe on the physically um, writing things that is challenging for the traditions uh, for the patriotic minds even for like advanced human rights defender this is something like dangerous and some posts on Facebook that says like you're pro-westerner or you're paid by the CIA or whoever might be leading into you being assassinated easily because the whole region is it's not <coughs> secure or stable there is no laws no um, you can't really raise um, like a lawsuit against someone in living in neighboring countries because they risked your life so things are chaotic and you might be killed for a post that you write on Facebook on that uh, sobering note um, I'm interested in uh, questions from the audience we have uh, we have a microphone we can circulate around let's get uh, some of you guys into the uh, into the interactions here uh, yeah I know you all been stunned silent I know but I'm sure somebody here is going to have a question. Was it scary? <laughs> Was I? We have a question right up here. Thank you. You will inspire others, I know. I'd like to know how you got started in journalism. You were born in Syria, and then give us a brief, how did it happen? Right. This is not a happy story either, so <laughs> let me warn you. Um, so journalism wasn't because I am from Idlib, as I told you. It's it's a conservative, uh, it's a conservative province. Um, when I was fifteen, I think I was among less than ten uh, girls, teenage girls, who refused to put a headscarf. I was religious at that point, but I didn't want to be enforced to do something. Um, and journalism wasn't for girls, especially that y if you want to study media, you need to travel to the capital, Damascus, which is 400 kilometers away. And girls are not supposed to be leaving their family house unless they're married. So there is no stage where you can live on your own. Um, I was lucky in a way because I didn't have so much men in my family. So I was mainly raised by my mom and my aunts, which gave me a bit of a space. Um, because we didn't have like the force of men telling us what to do or what to, not to do. Despite that, when I decided to study journalism in, I think, 2000, um, there was a huge backlash on my family. It was like, she's a woman. How are you going to allow her to travel to Damascus on her own and study journalism? Like, this is burning your honor. And she's going to be spinster for the rest of her life. And I always joke, I got married twice until now whenever they, they speak with me about that. So for them, that was a very shameful thing to do uh, because you're going to be mixing with men, your voice and your, your face, which is supposed to be kept for your husband, is going to be in the public. Um, I got the support of one person, was my mom, because she wanted me to be a journalist and she pushed me forward for that. Um, and then when I started actually writing for a local website after graduating. I started, because I have plenty of sources and network, I started writing about my hometown, because I can do it on the phone. And then I felt how like the general atmosphere has changed toward me. They still criticize me. They surely wouldn't propose for me to get married to their sons. However, they started feeling that I'm the only source who care about their stories because Idlib was very much underreported and like marginalized in the Syrian media. So I started getting like exclusive and scoops from the province. And then people started calling me out, telling like, I, I have this story and I have this source and I can put you in touch with that person. They start thinking about me as a journalist more than a woman journalist. And then the uprising started and everything has changed again. But that's how I was led to, to be a not Spencer journalist. That's not the saddest story you've said today. <laughs> <laughs> um, right up here. here. We've got the mic for you. Is there any chance 
that the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the groups, they, there's no way they can develop a peace among themselves, or is it just going to be 2,000 years of continuing to fight each other? There's no way that they can sit down and develop a common or a reasonable agreement between them where they can theoretically coexist or allow the other one to exist without constantly fighting and killing each other off and supporting these different terrorist groups? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert, uh, neither in religious nor um, in armed groups. However, how I see and I've lived those things, they're not left alone. <coughs> if they're left alone, they might be coming into that, but they're being used. Like the, the small Shia town in Idlib province had more connection to Hezbollah in Lebanon, far more than they had connection with my city, which is 20 kilometers away from them. They had Hassan Nasrallah, who is the head of uh, Hezbollah picture, in the main square, not Bashar's picture, which is their president. If they were left alone and not being used by Saudi, Iran, and other governments, they then will feel like they're just residents of the same area and they need to, uh, to coexist and live. Mm -hmm. But even the regime, they use the different sects. I think this is one of the tools that he used to survive that long, spreading hatred. If they become together, as we're seeing now in the Lebanese demonstrations, it will be impossible to control them. They made every sect very much scared of the other, that they segregate the communities. I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that they're Shi'ats down next to us. I just knew that someone who helped my mom in the household doesn't fast the way that we do. It took me like 20 years to recognize what those different sects are. But I knew that I shouldn't go to that town on my own because something bad would happen. So I was raised with those ideas. So I believe if they were left alone, they will certainly feel like citizens if they were given their rights, their basic rights. But as long as they're just being used as tool for fueling war, it is impossible. Um, so I had a question about, you mentioned that local journalists have to worry about um, their safety after publishing certain stories and international journalists might not have the same repercussions. So where do you see the responsibility of international journalists um, in regards to telling these stories? Do you think that they should uplift local narratives through the local journalists that are doing the work, or do you think they should take the responsibility of trying to objectively report on these issues, or do you think that's not possible? I believe some international journalists do have complications after like leaving, especially if they're planned to go back. I know many international journalists who were planning to keep going to the regime-held areas, for example. Like the BBC, they wouldn't even dare to, to express their own views or they were like um, try to avoid reporting on one stories and this is why the BBC have sent one person into the rebel held side and one person into Damascus side so they won't overlap. Um, so if you want to keep reporting they will still have the same kind of self-censorship to be able to keep going especially for freelancers who don't have like um, the support uh, like those who work for big uh, media ones. Um, I think it is easier for international journalists to report more freely and to cover critical issues that local journalists wouldn't be able to cover. But at the same time, I think for them to be able to get those stories and that access, they need the local journalists. And in many cases that I've witnessed, um, it was more being using than actually coordinating or writing the story with the local journalist. Um, <coughs> Although I am like a proper journalist and I studied journalism and I have been working in that field for 12, 13 years, I was reached by many international, big international organization, including the BBC, um, which I used to work with. But then I, during the uprising, I was reached as if like, oh yeah, you're an activist from the area. Can you put us in touch with three activists from that area? Give us one video producer from this area. I was treated as a free of charge fixer because I'm a local. And in many cases, even in big events, I was still being introduced as a citizen journalist because in the Western mind, 
it it also it's also not possible and they wouldn't believe that a local journalist can be actually an and can be actually an actual journalist without being a citizen one so there is this very few international journalists that i know actually could cross this line and they were they were reporting with very much cautious about the local journalists uh, the local sources they were awarding them for the time that they were giving them some stories uh, publishing th some stories would endanger the fixer or the local journalist who gave you the story. So uh, you also need to be cautious about that. Or if that journalist got kidnapped or arrested or injured because of the story that you published, very few also would be able to give the hand or take responsibility. Um, very few big international organizations actually hired those. Um, there's some correspondence for eight years with big uh, like um, big agency, news agencies, and they're working uh, on a freelance base. And they've been like the only person that you're counting on for the news for the last eight years. This is called a correspondent. But naming him or her a correspondent means that you need to take um, health insurance consideration and all of those rights that they don't want to give to the local journalist. So putting all of this <coughs> into consideration, I think only passionate and uh, human rights um, human rights interests, or those international journalists who have a human rights interest are the ones who are actually putting this, because it is personal. It is not being enforced by the laws or by the, the general guidelines of the organizations. It's very personal. Yes. And then you too. Hi. Um, so having lived in Syria in 2014, I believe in 2014, um, Bashar was up for election. Having lived in Syria in, in that time, can you speak a little bit to what elections had looked like um, in the country throughout that era, or what you think they'll look like in the future? W to begin with, I'm 34 years old. I've never voted in my life. I don't even know how to vote or what you do in that. Uh, my mom, because she was a teacher, she was forced to vote for Bashar to be able to keep her job. I think that was uh, before 2013, that was uh, 2007. So all of those who work for the government were given this card, voter's card, and unless you have the stamp for every election, you wouldn't be able to get like your health, uh, your health insurance, which is not a health insurance, but it's just the ability to go to a public hospital um, or get your pension. So my mom was forced, my mom was an opposer for a very long time, and whenever she was going to voting, she was coming back crying because she was forced to. So we don't even feel the elections. The only thing that I remember about the, the one before this election, I think it was 2000, it's every seven years, so yeah, seven. I was still at university. The only thing I remember are the huge amount of pictures spread all over the place and the very silly, cheesy uh, sentences supporting him. That's it. And I remember one of my flatmates uh, then, she was, uh, she was a professor um, in uh, the education university. She's from Hama. Most of her family were killed by the father of the president in the 80s when he massacred almost 2,000 in a couple of days. And her mom, at that point in 2007, started harassing her, like, Amar, did you vote? And she was like, my mom, no one would notice that I voted. And Khalas, leave me alone. And her mom kept calling her until she actually went down to the voting center and she voted. And I remember her coming back at the flat and she was like, please cut it off. I want it to be cut off. So she wasn't even forced like my mom because she just teach at university, but she was forced by the fear of her family to go and vote. And this is 2000. Seven. <coughs> in 2014, I was actually in, <coughs> in Eastern Aleppo. And the only thing I've seen from the votes are the many fight jets roaming around our heads. Um, we thought that they're going to be doing a bit massacre to celebrate the voting, because they usually start celebrating the voting when the voting starts, not after it, because they certainly know the results. Um, and I don't think any other elections are going to be different as long as the circumstances are still the same. Thank you, Zaina, for being here and for speaking to us. Um, I, you know, I, I think I asked this from a 
perspective of someone who's been living in the U.S. for the past seven years and who has, n other than memories and some family members, I don't have a lot of people who, I don't, and, and friends maybe, I don't, um, I'm mostly removed from the situation in Iraq and Syria uh, where I've grown up. Um, but so the where I find myself struggling is being here and um, I find that I'm constantly asked whether directly or indirectly to kind of uh, bear witness to what's going on, even to things that I haven't witnessed. So I, I want to ask you, um, I mean, <laughs> you're a journalist, so of course, um, the priority is to continue to speak and to continue to, to tell a story. But are there any points at which you hesitate to um, tell a certain story or to bear witness to something just because you you feel like you're being forced to or you're being used as like a token speaker for a, a people? Do you ever feel that sense? And when you do, do you feel that you can continue to tell a story or do you have to, sp it's difficult to have one foot in different places, but um, how do you deal with that? It is as difficult to be witness as difficult to keep speaking about it. And I don't blame many of those pioneer activists who led the uprising and were like amazingly, crazingly courageous now re are re living as refugees in Europe, uh, working in restaurants, in cafes, and they wouldn't even say that they're Syrians. And I wouldn't blame them. It is a burden. It is very difficult to be Syrian on its own. And then to live all what you live, and then to be disappointed so many times that you can't even count them, and left alone and seeing a war criminal taking over you're forced into exile that you didn't want to go into it. And then plenty of proxy wars happening. And no one is even asking you, what do you want? Do you want to go back? And everyone is bothered because you're out, although you're working and you're paying your taxes. So you feel that you're rejected by everyone, although the only thing that you wanted is the same basic rights that they wanted. I wouldn't blame those who are not bearing witnesses, are not speaking out. I'm, I completely understand them. I, on the opposite, I think I am telling those who are trying to keep bearing witness, you need a break. Otherwise, you're going to be collapsing. You need a break. And I know, sadly, many friends of mine who did the break and burned out because the frustration is so much. Two of them who were living in France, they went into, I don't know what they call it, the mental hospital. They lost it. They completely lost it. One of them turned into homeless in Germany. So bearing witness and keep like processing your personal trauma and trying to do something for those who are left out, who don't have the same opportunities, is very difficult. But then some of us will still have a bit of power. Like I am pretty privileged to be able to speak with you, to be here, to speak English, to have the ability to have access. So I'm going to be taking advantage of that as long as I can. Do you, f do you feel like an exile? I don't know how you would term how you would define it since you're living in London you don't feel you can go back or you can't you can't you can't so I mean does that do you feel like uh, homeless in that sense privilege aside um I don't know if you're following the many western bloggers who started video bloggers who started to go back to Syria and do their travel videos um about their trips claiming that they don't have any political point of view and they're not trying to advocate for the peace Syria, they're just visiting and documenting. I felt like I've been stabbed in the back when I watched the video. Like she is going to my hometown and she doesn't even care about what she's seeing and she's just filming the destruction as a background of her video. And I'm not even allowed to be on the border that in the country that I was ready, I'm still ready to be killed for. And it was like, everything that I did in the last eight years is just trying to make it better. Mm -hmm. And those people who don't care are going, and obviously the regime also is now giving them awards and they're being celebrated. But for me, I do feel like, well, maybe this is a bit cheesy, but 
being forbidden from going to the only place in the world that you want to be at is something that you cannot live with on a daily basis without struggle. Uh, we have a question. We have one more, and then I'm going to I'll finish with a question. Well, I want to thank you for your courage. And my question is, does ever appear in the press stories about the people who are funding the civil war, essentially, that you're having in your country? And do you have the right to keep and bear arms to defend yourself? Um, I didn't quite get it. OK, I'm sorry. Could you re say that again, for Zane? Do stories about the people who are funding the groups that are fighting one another, promoting the Civil War, ever appear in your country? And do you have the right to keep and bear arms? We keep and bear arms. Uh, arm yourself. We, we, we're in a war zone, and no, no one is putting laws. Um, everyone can do whatever they want. <laughs> um, in, in the regime, even before the uprising, only those people who are affiliated with the regime, uh, security agents, uh, not only the army, mainly the security agents, they, they had the right to have arms. So unless you're affiliated with the regime, you can't have arms. So this is a situation before the uprising. Now it's pretty chaotic. Um, I think some incident happened recently in a stronghold of, of a regime where a little guy whose father is in the army shot an officer in the street in a, in a jam rage. So he killed like a high officer in the army, and he's like 19, 18 years old kid. But he is related to a guy who is relevant for the Assad family who is ruling Syria. So we. We don't have like um, we don't have a state and laws and roles to to control that. Um, related to um, the countries or the groups that are funding the armed groups, there are many stories. But also, again, we don't have one media. We have the state propaganda. We have the opposition propaganda. We have the Kurdish propaganda, and we have some independent media in the middle, which is reporting objectively about all the violations committed by all parts. And those are the minorities, and those are the ones who lack the financial support, obviously, because they're doing a good job. Well, last question then. I mean, can you foresee, um, can you foresee this war? I mean, this is a little bit like your question, two parts. Can you foresee this war ending at some point? What would that look like? And I guess to bring it back to you, um, uh, do you ever do you think a lot about going back? And <coughs> what would your life ideally look like if you did? Uh, well, in the current situation, as long as the regime is in power, uh, my life would be in a basement being tortured. This is like certain, confirmed, no question. Um, if the war means just active fighting, I think it is ending soon because obviously Turkey is taking the north and then the regime is advancing and there is not going to be any clashes. But if we're speaking about conflict, I don't think it will be ending until people get the justice for all of the casualties that were committed, for all of the crimes. Um, and obviously there is no international um, attempt for taking any war criminal into court or doing anything about it. So I think we're going to be witnessing second, third, fourth, um, I wouldn't call them revolutions, maybe just uh, clashes, maybe um, chaotic situations, because people are very frustrated and they're, um, they still have people detained. They don't know their destinies. They still have people kidnapped. They don't know where their bodies are buried. And the um, economic situation is going worse and worse. Uh, the corruption within the regime is getting worse. Um, people are living on like $30 a month in the regime held areas. And to buy like a kilo of cucumber, you need to buy 50p. Is it p in the UK, uh, in uh, the US? Or cents. cents. So I think um, we're, we're going to be still witnessing uh, so many waves of conflicts um, until we have uh, Peace and peace needs um, justice. And justice is sadly not in the Syrian hands. It is in the international ones. Well, I hope that you're able to work on a book from, from London and keep everybody, you know, Americans need to know this stuff. We often don't pay attention to foreign policy unless there's a lot of Americans being killed, frankly. Uh, and, uh, but uh, it's a small globe. So thank you all for being part of that as thank well. Thank you. Thanks, Zaina, for being here.
directly in the sun. I feel like burning. Mm -hmm. I need to get the date of the chemical massacre. I was yeah, no, I couldn't, so I know, disappointed you know what? I by knew, myself. I knew it yesterday, and then I blanked on it. When 2013, I was but I need to get the dates. 